there were times through my career where I second guessed myself. I was my own worst enemy. Then when you finish that, now I'm just a general person. I'm no longer Simon Cox, the footballer. I'm now Simon Cox. That's it. You get used to living a certain way and doing certain things. And then all of a sudden, when you have to sort of rein things in a little bit, whether that's spending, whether that's holidays, you know, whatever it is, it takes a big ego hit. When you go from being able to afford to go to this restaurant or that restaurant two, three nights a week or whatever it is to then being able to go to them once a month, you sat there and go, you know, am I doing enough? And then going and earning a 30 grand a year job. Like that's where your ego takes a big hit. Former Premiership footballer and international Irish star, Simon Cox joins me on my podcast. We talk all things on the pitch as well as off the pitch. And also had a, a few questions for him about what life is like now he is retired. Be happy, never content, really enjoy this episode. Right, welcome back to the podcast, Steve Asali Study. Um, Simon, Simon Cox, uh, former professional footballer, only retired quite recently, actually. There's the obvious things I'm going to talk about. Obviously, you playing for Re Republic of Ireland between 2011 and 2014. That must have been an absolute dream come true and also a very, very important point in your career. You played for the likes of Reading, Swindon Town, West Brom, Nottingham Forest, Southend, uh, also Sydney, Western Sydney Wanderers, I think I pronounced that yeah. right. Um, I want to talk about retirement, but typically when I first started my podcast, I would have asked any athlete, boxer, rugby player, football player, the obvious questions like, how did you get into it? What adversity did you go through, etc. I'm going to actually do this back to front now. Okay. okay. Something when I was doing a bit of research in you stood out. Uh, on one of your posts and I wanted to dig into it a little bit more because I could talk to you about being a footballer right and if you're into football if you're a fan you might be able to relate to it but let's be honest most people in this country in the world can't because they're not an athlete they're yep. not a footballer they yep. can only hear your story but what we can relate to is what you said here 22nd of June recently you said <laughs> the real struggle on an Instagram post yeah and I think this is so relatable and most importantly, very, very relevant to today's culture because a lot of people, especially men, alpha type males, which I would consider that's what you are. Thank you. I consider myself <laughs> that as well. Enough of us don't kind of really talk about it. So that, that particular post, I watched the whole entire thing. I thought it was a really, really good, open and honest uh, post. Yeah. What did you mean by the real struggle? Um, I think... It was it was basically a post about me and retirement. It was a it was a post that, as you said, that in today's world, in today's life, that men are very shady on on, on speaking about issues that are, you know, especially in regards to mental health. Um, they don't want to seem like they're vulnerable or, or anything else like that. But I, I sort of used it as I retired in, officially retired in October. And I went from 17 years of being told where to be, what time to be it, what time to be there, how to dress, how to act, you know, structure, routine for 17 years. I got told exactly where to do, where, what and how to do it. Then you retire and all of that goes out the window. So you then go to bed at whatever time you like, you wake up whatever time you like, you eat and drink whatever you like, you behave in however you like. And I found that to be a real struggle because I like routine. I've, I've had it most of my, well, I've, I'd say that everybody has routine throughout their life. You go to school, so you get up in the morning, you go to school from nine till three, nine till four, whatever it is. You go home, do your homework, you have lunch, you have dinner, and then you play with your friends, and then you go to bed. That's that's the start of your routine. Then all of a sudden you go to work, you get up in the morning, you shower, you go to work, you finish work, you go out for drinks or whatever, and then you go home and then you repeat that on a cycle. I then struggled when I didn't have that routine. So my my... The video I put out was just to sort of say to people that no matter what life, what background you have, there are multiple, multiple people out there struggling. And I'm one of them. 
and I'm not afraid to to say that because I think it sometimes takes people who have have from different backgrounds for who have potentially done really well in in life or celebrities or whoever they might be for the next person to look at that post and say, Do you know what? If he's struggling and he's okay to say it, I'm actually okay to say it. And I think that's a more powerful message to send out to people than it is saying it to your mate in the pub saying, Oh, I was struggling one day. Do you know what I mean? Like I need just need to like find a bit of routine. Actually saying it to you know, I'm lucky enough I've got a couple of thousand people on Instagram and things like that actually putting it out there to a lot of people if it helps 10% of that then I'm I've done my job and I'll continue to to put that message out there because I feel like the more we as as males can speak about that sort of thing the better we will become mm, definitely perfect preparation prevents piss poor performance remaining professional and presentable is definitely important to you and your loved ones today i'm speaking about the manscape perfect package 3.0 this blade does everything it needs to do to keep you clean and satisfied down there and presentable of course by signing up today you get every three months a renewable blade you get 20 percent off and free shipping and for a limited time only if you sign up today, you get two free gifts. As well as a blade, inside this box, there are other accessories to keep yourself fresh, presentable, and looking very, very clean. Sign up today and get your discount by using the code below at manscaped.com. You also go on to say that, um, I think you said clear in the inverted commas, the negative energy. Now I, I've got my own interpretation of negative energy. Um, probably the obvious ones, but what what did that mean to you, negative energy? So for for me, I actually had a, I went to, to a, a, a sort of group session with a former manager of mine and a couple of former players of mine, all ex-players now, um, a few weeks ago. And the the main thing to come out of that session was about negative energy about negative press things you can and can't control so me saying that there was i when i was a player i didn't worry about negative comments social media it didn't bother me that because i knew my value as a as a player to my teammates to my manager and i knew what i could bring to a football team the only people that could tell me whether I was right or wrong was my manager, my teammates, myself, or my family. And I and I stuck by that throughout my whole career. There were times through my career where I second guessed myself, whether I was good enough, whether I believed in what I was doing at the at the top level, whether I believed I should have been there, you know, whether you could control what somebody else was thinking about you at that time. I was my own worst enemy. Then when you finish that, the negative area of myself was, now I'm just a general person. I'm not no, I'm no longer Simon Cox, the footballer. I'm now Simon Cox, that's it. And stepping back into society, theoretically, as a genuinely normal person was, or is and has been a real struggle for me because of you get used to living a certain way and and acting a certain way and you know doing certain things and then all of a sudden when you have to sort of rein things in a little bit whether that's spending whether that's holidays whether that's you know whatever it is it takes a big ego hit hmm. and and I think a lot of people that's where they struggle is and and I and I listen I'm like I say I hold my hands up I have that struggle because yeah. I think for me it's like when you go from being able to afford to go to this restaurant or that restaurant and you know two three nights a week or whatever it is to then being able to go to them once a month is you sat there and go you know am i doing enough and then going and earning a, a you know whatever it would be like a 30 grand a year job that's 
that's where it, it becomes like a big like that's where your ego takes a big hit bit of a culture shock absolutely yeah you know and, and the best people are the people who plan for those scenarios and they're the ones who are able to deal with that a lot better than the ones who sort of get to 31 32 33 and then go shit now where do i go mm. the um as you were talking i couldn't help but be sort of drawn to conversations i've had with other people on my podcast and the way you were talking is very uh, drawing parallels between like someone in the army special mm-hmm. services and then obviously how you were talking and it's it's kind of like the same thing you're in the army you know you have to uh, your boots got to be a certain way you got to iron your, your clothes a certain way you yeah. go off to battle do your thing you're training you've got your group around you you're very very important you've got all this concentration on you but then when you're sort of we back into society you can see why a lot of them go a bit crazy and they're going a bit mental and yeah. this is the next point i mean uh who was i talking to ryan burnett two-time world champion boxer uh great boxer um i actually funny enough trained down this, his former old gym boxing booth adam booth gym mm-hmm. um great people down there and even though he didn't go off the rails per se he was very very close to because what he said to me is the moment that he stopped his career way before it should have stopped even okay. though he achieved two world world titles it's because he had a serious back injury mm-hmm. and he went into a fight and it wasn't right so he had to call it a day so he probably he achieved his goal but i would not that he said this to me, but financially probably could have made a bit more money mm-hmm. because he probably had three, four, five other big fights down the line, which would have made him lots of dough. Yeah. And I think when that all stopped, he did admit getting onto the onto the booze. And he, it was only at a certain point where he said to himself, I've got to really control myself here because if, if I don't, I'm going to go down this direction. I've had footballers on here saying the yeah. same thing. I've had so many people, even very successful business people, people have sold their companies they've got all this money and before you know it they're doing substances they've, yeah. they've got mental health issues they're doing drink they're they're self-harming yeah. they're abusing their family and i i can honestly see how you can, you know people can go, go down that route but i mean was there ever a moment you thought jesus i'm actually gonna sort of lose my complete mind here because i've got basically i feel like in sales they say this you're either meaningful specific or you're wondering generality. Okay. And what that means is if you don't plan and don't have goals, you're wandering around life. Yep. You know, you're literally walking around in a room and you have no idea why you're there. Yep. When you're a meaningful specific, you've got a target. Yeah. You know why you're there. Yeah. So what was that like for you? You know, like the did you honestly think about, you know, was it substances or was there anything going in your head where you considered thinking, oh, I might go down the wrong path here? Yeah, so I <sighs> My uncle was a was a semi pro footballer, um, but he, when he finished playing, he turned into an alcoholic, and he he did the worst thing in the world. He owned a pub, right? So every day, him and like, and he lived above the pub. So every day, the regulars would come in. He'd sit with them. He'd have a few drinks. He'd do the pub. He then nighttime finishes he'd sit and he'd have his drinks and 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 that was his life that was his routine you know and and it that wasn't the end of him other you know things obviously went wrong with him um and and he ended up passing um so i know what that does and i've seen that and i i'd be wrong if i sat here today and said that there hasn't been days in the last, I don't know, what, four or five weeks where I've sat at home and thought, do you know what, that bottle of Jack looks really good to me. You know, I could easily sit here and just, I could nail that. And, but I know what the effects of it are because I know if I did that, it's hurting my wife, it's hurting my little girl and once might be okay but it wouldn't be once and I'm one of those people that if I liked it I'd I'd carry on doing it so once would turn to twice would turn to three times and I know what would happen in the end she would leave me you'd then not see your little girl we've got another little one on the way so all of a sudden then your family then is separate so I understand that that's that's my driving force not to do that yeah 
weekends and and as a family and things like that you go and you enjoy yourself and and you have your drinks and everything else and and rightly so no i've never never thought about like self-harming or anything else like that drugs nothing either like but the the drink is the one thing i sit there and think i could easily like i could take my little girl to school or to nursery she goes at eight o'clock in the morning and she doesn't get picked up till quarter to six so at eight o'clock i could go home i could go into the gym and have a bit of a routine that way i'd finish the gym i could be at the pub at 11 and i could be there till 11 till 5 30 so it's sort of six hours and then i could i could just stumble home and i could do that day in day out week in week out but i know what would what would come of it and and what would come of it would be i'd have nothing at the end of it and that's not so that's my driving force not to do it so i have i do have those thoughts don't get me wrong like i i, I really do and, and they are they normally come when if i like I apply for a job and i don't get the first interview or i get the first interview and i'm thinking oh brilliant and then i don't get a second one and then you think the rejection of like trying to get a job for me is like, so what, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Like, why can't, why should I not just do that? As in like the drink, why should, cause that, that looks really good to me and nobody can touch me once I've, once I'm in my headspace of I'm away and I'm, I'm having a good time and everything. No one touches you then. But then the, the come down from there is that's where it all sort of comes hitting you like a 10 ton of bricks. Mm. I have I've had so many conversations with my my, my business partner about alcohol um, because you know being thirty six years of age and being around art collectors, investors, doing the podcast, athletes, high profile people, business people, you get to meet every type of person out there and you get to hear their stories. And the common thing is, you know, if there's ever a problem, usually somewhere along the way is going to be the alcohol. And we always say to each other, it's mad because. Alcohol, alcohol is socially acceptable. Mm. So, um, if you're getting married, you have a drink. Yeah. If someone dies awake, you have a yeah. drink. If it's your birthday, you have a drink. Christmas, you have a drink. Bank holiday, you have a drink. Weekend, you have a drink. Go to a nice resort, you have a drink. There, there isn't, there isn't many excuses out there where <laughs> you you don't you don't have to, like where it's all right to have a drink all the time, and that's that is the big problem with it. And I think where people start to lose their kind of routine and their mission in life, then the drink is the kind of easy answer. It's the wrong answer. Coping but mechanism, but, but mechanism. I understand it because it does my stuff. And I've, I've done it loads of times where I start drinking a red wine and my mind, even I'm there, my mind feels more relaxed and I'm, uh, and sometimes I do come up with creative ideas and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And that, that also becomes addictive because you have your self talks and I'm drinking, but do you know what? I'm actually getting benefits out of it. You start convincing yourself why you should be doing it. Yeah. But then over time, you're feeling crap. Your yeah. body feels crap. You're lethargic the next day. And yeah, what I'm just trying to get to is just so easy to access drink. After this podcast, me and you could just walk two seconds down the road yeah. and we could be at the Hamyard Hotel and we could smash as many drinks as we physically could and everybody would be all right with it. Do you know yeah. why? Because they'd be like, Thursday's a new Friday. Yeah. It's so oh, the sun's out. Go and treat yourself. Yeah. But, you know, it's a poison at the end of the day. Yeah. And so when I was in that, that sort of group session with my ex-manager, my ex-manager, um, he stopped drinking in 2014 or 15 because he was in such a bad place personally. Like his, like his family, they split. He lost a lot of things. Bear in mind, like two years before that, he was, super successful got promoted to the Premier League he was now a Premier League manager he won manager in a month in whatever month it was so he was on top of the world but his coping mechanism was drink and then he had to it, it took his wife who they'd split and he, he took his wife to basically say you're being an ass." You know, you, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting us as a family. And then it then took him to ask her to call someone to help him. 
So that in itself is like your family, your circle of friends is the main point where when you're struggling, like I am, am, not was, am, um, your circle of friends is are the people who you trust the most are the people mm. who you can lend an ear to, the people that you can go through. You, you've had a friend of mine on here um, and I sat down with him about two or three weeks ago and I said to him, I said like, what, like, how did you go through it? Because he's gone through the exact same thing as me and still is going through it. So I needed to understand how he got his coping mechanisms without the drink are like, what is he doing? Because I need to take the advice of someone who's been through it, is still going through it, but has the coping mechanisms, which isn't a drink. Mm-hmm. And 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 we sat and we, I mean, I was probably there. I hadn't seen him for a while, but I was probably there for four hours. You know, just, and it was chatting absolute rubbish sometimes. But then there's them little nuggets that you take from people that you go, ah, oh, you know what, that's like a, that's quite, that's quite interesting. You know, like, ah, I might try that. And then all of a sudden you think, you wake up the next day and you go, I remember what he said, that. I'll, I'll try that. And and you just find your little your little pieces of information that you can use and, and you take that one from there, you take that one from there and then you then you end up forming your own sort of ideas. The um, The common thing I've seen with athletes and also let's call the normal person, business person, mm-hmm. and I don't, I've never been through therapy per se, but yeah. I've heard it in, indirectly through people who've gone through it. One of, one prime example is Tyson Fury, and I believe you know you, you're doing the same, which is the training. Mm. It, it, I know people hear this time and time again, and it's almost a bit of a broken record, especially if some of the younger's listening to this. And not adolescent, they're not going through it, but they're they're listening to it, and it's not sunk in quite yet. When you train, regardless whether you're going through challenges, anxiety, fear, depression, etc., even if you're not going through that, and you just train, yeah. The endorphins, yep. the serotonin or whatever it's called, the, the 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 dump that you get natural drug in your body mm-hmm. makes you feel so fucking good and yep. so so on point. But also that same feeling can overcome even short term and then probably long term the the depression and anxiety. Yep. So I saw that you were doing the Peloton yep. and you you admitted that there were some programs on there that I think you were like slightly hesitant to do or a bit fearful of doing because it's going to push you to the max. But you knew you wanted to commit on it and yep. make yourself accountable because you know that's going to get you through maybe a hard patch in your life. Yeah. So I, I sort of set myself, when I did that, the real struggle, I set myself a challenge and I'm lucky enough i just after lockdown, we had a gym built in the garden, like, because we were sort of sick of going to like the local gyms and stuff. One, they weren't fully open and, and there was times you could be in there and times you couldn't. So we thought, oh, we'll have one built in the garden. Lucky enough that we, we were able to do that. Um, and we bought a, a Peloton bike and a Peloton treadmill. And then we had the equipment as well. And on the... Bear in mind, when I was a player, I hated running. So I wasn't a runner. Like, so that, when we bought the treadmill, I was like, oh. I always said to myself, when I finished playing, uh, the runner, like the treadmill, I'm going to get rid of that because I'm not even going to do that anymore. But then when I got it, and if anyone's ever done a class like that, you know, there's other ones out there. Because of the instructors that are on the telly, uh, on, on your screen, they give you the motivation. So when I went on there and I saw, and I'd, I'd been on and been off and, and done like little bits here and there. But when I went through it, there were 101, uh, sorry, 131 treadmill boot camps. So they're 60 minutes long. They're, let's say, 15 minutes of tread, they're 15 minutes of floor, and that floor could be legs, shoulders, arms, core, glutes whatever it could be a mixture of all sorts then you go back on 15 minutes of the tread then you finish for 15 minutes on the floor again and and i thought i'd just done a uh, a two-week all-inclusive holiday in dubai anyone who goes on all-inclusive tears the ass out of it we did the same um and i got back and i thought i need my routine i need something to do you know i i 
while I was on holiday, I applied for like three or four jobs, was waiting to hear back from them. But in the meantime, I needed something to do. I needed something to put my mind and get my mind active. So I looked at it and it was 131 that I hadn't done. Bearing in mind, Peloton ad, all kinds of content every day. And there's this, they do a thing called Saturday 60, which is trade or bike. So my 131 will always continue to move. But the 131 from where I started to the number 131 will stay the same. So when I get to 131, there'll be probably 40 that I haven't done. So then I'll aim for the 40. But it's just the fact that I, there was 131 that I hadn't done. And I thought to myself, I'm going way back. Like this is 2019 when they first came out. And I'll be honest, some of them are rubbish. But it wasn't about what they were. It was about going in and having and setting myself 60 minutes every day. And listen, it might, if it, if it took me 131 days, then great. But the longer it takes me, it means I'm busy. And that to me is more important because I could like came in here and worked out in London today. So that's, so it wouldn't be like, I think I'm on day, it would be day 23, but, or session 23. But because I worked out today, I won't do one when I get home, but tomorrow I'll do one. So that'll be 23. Then Saturday morning will be 24, you know, or Friday morning be 24, then, you know, so on and so on. Um, so yeah, it just, it just gave me something and it gave me a purpose and it gave me a routine and something to aim for. And then, like I say, when I get to 131, yes, I would have ticked that box, but then I'll set another one and it will be the, the others that I haven't done. So it, it was just something that I needed to, to get into a routine of doing. Mm. And you you definitely support the training at any level. Yeah, gym, playing sport. Yeah, going for a walk, running. I I is I, just the yeah, best thing for you. I I did something similar. I did thirty days consecutive, thirty consecutive days, and whether it be bike, whether it be treadmill, whether it be walking, whether it be golf, whether it be a jog outside, whatever it would be. I did 30 consecutive days and let alone the fact that I did 30 days, it was like, you you just feel better. You just see something better in yourself. You know, like Joe Wicks, obviously the body coach, a lot of people will know who he is, but a lot he always says that he gets rid of his scales because he calls them the sad step. So you get on them and never any, nobody has ever jumped on a set of scales and gone, oh, I'm really happy with that. They might be at the end of whatever they've done, but at the start, like I got on on after the uh, holiday and I went, that is the heaviest I've ever been. And I was like, you're a disgrace. Like, you know, you need to do something about it. So when I finish my one, three, one, I'll jump back on the scales or I'll jump on them every 32 days. It's going to be, cause it's like three quarters, um, or it's a quarter every, every 32 days or so. So what I'll do is I'll end up jumping on them and then going, yeah, you know, from where I was 90, 92.8 kilos. I used to be like, my fighting weight was like 81. I was like, what am I doing? You know, like, and bear in mind, I only retired in October, so not a lot of time, really. To be like 11, 12 kilos more, I was like, you know, I need to do something about my life. So that's why when I get to the 131 and I've, I've you know, ticked off a goal of doing 131, and then I've ticked off a goal of being 92.8 to, I don't know, it, I might even be 84. But you know what? I actually look better and I actually feel better. And the fact that I've done it is like a, a big tick in the box and it and it and it will help me because I can then progress to the next the next stage of it. Yeah. Do you know what? Um I don't know why, but the, the culture seems to be people look at the calories mm. and they look at the weight. And I always tell people, unless I'm training for a fight, yeah. And I don't really even look at the calories when I'm training for a fight. I'm just looking at the weight and how I can get down to that weight. I look at day to day 
and I'm not saying perfect. You know, I'm definitely not the shape I want to be. I need to need to step stuff up. I've been away quite a bit, and I'm making fucking excuses. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I look at sugar content because that turns into fat mm. faster than the calorie intake from a sweet potato or a bowl yeah. of rice, for example. And I'd look at how many times I'm training a week, mm. etc. And I believe if I'm eating clean, whole foods, which is real food not artificial or man-made put together bullshit stuff yeah. um i know the weight would just come off anyway yeah. and and i just feel and look better but so many people get engrossed and get obsessed with oh the calorie this cal-, mm. you know and i get it if you're specifically going for something but day to day i think i think sometimes that is the wrong thing to look at it's loads of people are consuming way too much sugar yeah way too much salt and these are all things that keep loads of water with attention for no reason sugar is just absolutely terrible for fat and it's terrible for so many other things and they're probably not actually training enough they're not probably not being active enough yeah so obviously there's there's training for a reason and there's like feel bad saying it my neighbor like like i used to see them down the gym and they would just like they get on the like the the bikes and they would just pedal away, you know, like nice and steady and whatever. And they'd be there for like an hour and just be pedaling away. And and they don't do anything, you know. And I, I just look at them and think, you, you're not doing anything. Like, I'd rather you come down. And this is why like my 60 minute thing is do something that's going to sort of get your heart rate going. Do something that's going to burn your calories. Do something that's going to like give you something to like feel energized for the rest of the day because I normally would do it in the morning so between sort of 9 and 10 30 I'd normally get around in in and around that time so I've had my breakfast taking it one to, to nursery I've had my breakfast then I'm gonna go in do my hour and then my day then basically starts with whatever that consists of but you need to work hard like you can't just go down there like my neighbor and just like just pedal away and nice easy goes in you can have a phone call and and be on the phone for like 45 minutes to an hour like that's not what it's there for it's there to work your bollocks off basically mm. so that you can feel the benefits of training and working hard otherwise it's there's no point definitely Definitely. I know there was a guy I used to work with many years ago called Colin and he would go to the gym every single... I mean, admittedly, one thing I would hand to him, he naturally was gifted with uh, genetics. High he, metabolism. He, he yeah. could I eat, hate them people. He could eat, he could party whatever he wanted and nothing would change in his body. It was a good looking fella, good, 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 good shape about him. Not super ripped, but yeah. nice shape. But he would do exactly the same training workout three, four times a week, every single week, would never change it. And I used to say to him sometimes, do you honestly think you're getting the best out of do, doing that? And then when I look at other people, it's all, almost like the same. Just, you either go to the gym or you go to train. Yeah. It's two different things. Yeah. You know, some people do more burning a calorie because they're walking around that gym talking to people, taking <laughs> selfies, yeah. or, rather than actually being on, on, a, on a piece of equipment. Um, just going to dovetail back into something you said earlier about ego. Mm-hmm. I think men definitely, definitely, definitely experience this probably more than females. I don't know that for sure. I've got no real evidence to back it up. I just can tell you my own perception. When I was when I was younger, um, bearing in mind I was a plumber before mm-hmm. I got into sales. Um, there was a small time I was a barrister's clerk. Mum and dad are typical middle class. Um, yeah. Uh, and you know, I didn't really have any uber successful rich people, family members around me, but I always wanted to become a success. And when I got to about 20, 21, started doing pretty well, uh, or fully, fully commissioned salesperson. And the typical thing you do is start heading towards the watches and the cars. And there was a bit of a culture between our company and another firm who were a bit aligned. They weren't the same, but they, they, you know, there was, there was a friendship group between them both that you weren't really cool or weren't really doing too well unless you had two cars. <laughs> so it was like, you know, you had a four by four and you had a sports car. Yeah. And for a long time, I had like Ferrari 458 Pulse Turbo, got rid of Pulse Turbo, had a Bentley Super Sports convertible, had the Bentley Super Sports convertible, got rid of that car and got a Lamborghini Performante. Mm-hmm. And 
I remember January might have been 2008 coming no or was it 2009 coming coming into new year I had a flying month again and probably as a salesperson like 50 60 grand or something like that and the following month the company shut down and I was like oh my god like yeah. the, my whole world is going to collapse yeah. underneath my feet but for fucking ages I would I would not give in and say no I had to keep the cars I had yeah. to keep the cars and the cars nearly cost me so much. Yeah. And even I got rid of one and I had to keep the Lambo because I was kind of, I felt like throughout I my friendship it. group, yeah. because of my image and my profile, pro, when I say profile, I'm not talking about a celebrity, I'm just saying profile within my my little group of mates I had, yeah. who were plumbers, who were carpenters, and I was probably the it boy at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, and I literally was struggling to put petrol in it. And I had to actually pick times when I could go out in it because people were like, oh, come out, come out. And, and I was like, oh, I had to make up an excuse. And looking back now, I'm like, what a fucking idiot. Yeah. Like, what an idiot. And you were putting like materialistic things first before logical things. Yeah. And I think that so many people go through it. Now, as a footballer, I'm just going to play out something, which I don't know if it's the truth, but it's my perception of it. You're a premiership footballer or a professional footballer you've played internationally, mm -hmm. you played against some of the biggest names in the world. That, just that affiliation, being next to those people and being incredible yourself is phenomenal. Being paid loads of money. So that's the first kind of uh, ego booster. When you're making loads of money, mm -hmm. it's almost like you feel that everything else in your life is perfect because like, look at me, I'm making loads of yeah. money. I must be intelligent. I must be this, I must be that. And I've realized the 36 years of age, because you earn a lot of money, doesn't make you more intelligent. No. Doesn't make you more superhuman it mm. just makes means you make more money but yeah. i learned that a bit the hard way then then you're you're in the papers you know it'd be like oh this person's done this this person's done that and it kind of gives you ego boost then there's going to be fans like literally fans come over to you and say you're great you scored mm. a goal and they're reminding you of all the great things you've done then you've got females throwing herself at you mm. and it's almost like you're walking around like got a 10-inch fucking cock <laughs> and like anything you touch turns to gold yeah. and i could imagine that is like an inflated, like, oh my God, this is great. The only way I can describe a similar thing is like when I've won a boxing match, I literally think after the boxing match, if someone offered me a fight with Conor Ben, I would say, yeah, I'll beat him. Because yeah. the, the ego, because yeah. I've just won a fight and that's far from the truth. Yeah. Far from the truth. But in that moment of insanity, you think you can do it. So going back to the ego thing then, like, would you say, you know, is it is a mixture between the money, the the fame, you know, people adoring you and stuff. Does it does it kind of inflate your ego? And then the moment you're out of that, it's kind of a big reality check and you think, oh my God, like things ain't as glossy as they used to be. Yeah, I think, and people were quite quick to to say, Cor, you've like, you've gone the other way, haven't you? You know, whether that be weight or whether that be a sec, like a, a different job or whatever so when you're in the football celebrity world if you want to call it that and then all of a sudden you go to be a gardener and then you go like like let's say i live in essex and i played for a team in essex played for south end done relatively well with them um from a personal point of view so imagine then if i then went and became a gardener or a painter or a decorator and they phoned up the firm that i was working for and then all of a sudden i walked through the door and they were, they were a fan and they'll go i used to be that guy who used to do like scoring loads of goals and you go yeah I, i'm not that guy anymore and and they go cool like life must have been hard or, or whatever like they're really quick to to sort of dig at you instead of going thinking it in a completely different way going like life must have been really good like at least he's out there and he's trying to support his family like from from outside people they they're not very careful with their words whereas inside in like i say small small group of friends they're the ones where you look at and you go right so the most important thing is your family and supporting them and making sure that food's on the table and your kids are well looked after and your missus is well looked after and your heating's turned on in the, in the, in the winter time. 
And the best way to do that is to go out and earn money. Now, whether you earn money by playing football, whether you earn money by being a movie star or a singer or whatever, and you, you have that ego, when that stops, you need to get rid of that ego as quick as you possibly can. Because going, in a, going from earning tens of thousands a week to earning, let's say, 30 grand a year, it takes a big, big person to take that hit and leave the ego away, like leave it out, take it, throw it away. Because if you don't, it, it swallows you, it swallows you whole because you, you, you just won't be able to deal with people not looking at you the same way or people thinking badly of you or, or whatever it is. So the ego is the biggest the biggest thing that you have to get rid of. I'm going to ask a bit of an intrusive question now. Uh, one, because forgetting this podcast, I would I would like to ask it anyway, because I'm always yeah. fascinated. Um, I'm going to talk about money. Yeah. Um, I, I have, uh, as far as conversation of money with my father-in-law we have a i have a love hate relationship with him i love him obviously but you know outside that conversation yeah. but like even last night so the the females lionesses were mm -hmm. playing yeah. obviously they had that wicked win and come back and, and stuff and i want to talk to you about that as well your opinion um and he mentioned again i don't follow football loads mm -hmm. like like maybe when i was a little younger but someone got signed recently for 71 million pounds for a, a, a footballer not not a female it was one of the the high profile ones he was telling me last night he was like how can someone be worth 71 million like, and then he would say something saying something stupid but which i think a lot of the older generation who have got probably bad money mindset traits mm -hmm. and i do unfortunately mel if you listen to this i do think you've got a bad money money <laughs> mind, mindset i really do but they'll go how can it be worth 71 million no one in the world should be worth that money they should give the money to the nhs like it's, it's like it's like mate yeah. that's not that's not reality like yeah. you know that's and then i have to go well aren't doctors more important than footballers like they ask like a bit of a sort of a, a a loaded question yeah. because if you say no they're like oh you don't think you know, yeah, yeah, yeah and it's like there's there's x amount of tens of thousands millions of doctors nurses and i'm not disregarding what they do but there's more of them yeah how many premiership or champions uh, champions league or champion uh footballers are out there and on from the face of the planet and what is a likelihood if i pursued being a doctor, nurse, or whatever, or pursue being a professional footballer, which one am I more likely to get and actually become a, pro a professional in? Probably the doctor if I persevered on it. Yeah. It's very unlikely, really, mm. if you look at the probability of me becoming playing for Arsenal and, yeah. and, and being a striker. Yeah, you're like the 0.1%. Yeah. So, so, so I personally love when I see footballers earning a load of money because I actually think it inspires me. I'm not going to go back at the hands of time and try and become a professional footballer, but I like the fact that your young individuals following a passion that you knew all the cards were stacked against you, but you found the way through mm. and now you've, you've quote unquote made it and, and you're doing what you love and you took a risk and there's still big gambles every day. Cause yeah. if you break your leg, yeah. you could be out and, and that, that yeah. is, that is you done. So like at the height of your career, what were you earning? Just over three quarters of a million. Well, over three quarters of a million quid. So to break that down week, there's, they talk about that a week now, 15, 16 grand a week. And what was that like earning that? I was really, I was really lucky. Like my wife, she works in wealth management, right? So she, in the city, she does really, really well for herself. And give massive, massive credit to my parents because from an early age, we were I was told, me and my brother, we were told to save money, you know? So, and when, whenever, like when I was young, and I got on the bench or I was traveling with the first team. My first win bonus was a thousand pound when I was at Reading. I was 17 at the time and it was a thousand pound. And my mum, she said to me, when it lands in your pay packet, it comes to me and it goes in the savings account. Fine. Every time I was on the bench or every time there was a win bonus or every time like I got an appearance or anything else like that, that money, because when I was young, I was obviously living at home 
all that money, all my expenditure was was minimal. So everything I could, I, I put in a savings account. So I was taught from really early on to save, which was great, brilliant lesson to learn. Then it got to the summer that year and I wanted to go on holiday. My girlfriend at the time, I was like, oh, we'll go, we'll go on holiday. So then I wanted new clothes and new shoes and everything else. And new wanted, sunglasses. Yeah. The whole everything. I was, like I say, 18 at the time. And we went on holiday. I remember coming home one day and my dad said to me, so what have you done today? I said, oh, I booked a holiday. And he, and I was wait, I wanted him to turn around to me and go, don't worry, I'll pay for that. But he didn't. He was like, well, there's your savings account. You've obviously paid for it. Like, so... I understood that you save it to to spend it and and use it wisely. When it got to the stage of I was earning thousands of pounds a week and tens of thousands a week, what my wife said to me was, "You give me or you put in this account. Once you've paid off, once you've paid the mortgage and you've paid the bills and and we've we've done all the outgoings." Once we've done that, you then put, you then keep yourself about five grand, five to 10 grand, because you don't need any more than that. Like you, you don't, you really, really don't like, because whatever you buy is a duplicate of something. So you don't need it. So what we used to do is like, let's say for instance, I don't know what, if it was 60 grand a month would come into me. If I then turn around and said, right, 45 of that is going straight into that account. Bills and and cars and mortgages and everything else is going out of that. And it, le- it, it left me with like five grand. Oh, if you can't live on five grand after you've paid everything else out, like you're doing something seriously, seriously wrong, right? And I don't care where your house is or what cars you've got and everything else. Like petrol... Um, food. food, water, everything like anything like night a night out or trip to the to the pub or meals in London. What you can't spend like you shouldn't be able to because you're not going out every night because like now we've obviously got family and things like you're not doing it every night. So you're doing it once a week or once every couple of months. So you're fine with all your with your five grand. Then all of a sudden at the end of the month you then look at what you've got and then you just top it back up to five grand. So then all of a sudden back into your savings accounts goes back into a lot of money, you know? So we just kept building that up, building that up, building that up. I was on, I was on that probably for, I don't know, six years around about, like three different clubs, couple of years here, three years there, couple of years there, like maybe six, seven years I was on around that money. So we we built up like a really, really decent pot. Bought a house, then ended up moving back to Reading, sold that house like in, in Nottingham where we were living at the time. Took a little while, bought three, uh, bought four property. We were renting. Now we've bought our own house, still got the four property, just bought another one. Like, so we, we were quite, we were really smart with it. Like, don't get me wrong, there's like so many things that I, shouldn't have bought you know like i said like duplicating things i used to go into like harvey nichols in birmingham all the time um and selfridges and buy i mean i've got boxes i mean when i say boxes, i've got like 30 pairs of like christian Louboutin trainers all pairs probably brand spanking new don't need them don't wear them don't want them you know i've got loads of pairs of d square jeans I've had loads of D squared t shirts, uh, Dolce and Gabbana t shirts, thousand pounds like jackets and things like that. Like, don't need them. Wish somebody would have slapped me at the time for, for even thinking about buying it all. But nobody does. And, and rightly so, it's your money. You do whatever you like with it. But at no point, if I'd have sat, like, I bought, this is a mad story. Remember uh, Entourage, the, the yeah. TV series? or the HBO series, right? I bought an Aston Martin because I watched that series. That's how mad I was at the time because I was sat at home and I had, and you said about having two cars, you have your four by four and you have your sports car. 
I had a Range Rover Supercharge and I had an Aston Martin Vantage. And the Aston Martin on the basis that I watched Vinnie Chase and Turtle and Drama all zinging around LA in theirs. And I thought, oh yeah, that looks absolutely mad. I'm going to do that in Birmingham. <sighs> I mean, and then when I end up selling it, I, I put probably about four or 5,000 miles on it brand new like bought actually i bought one off of a dealer and the, the clutch had pretty much gone so i end up selling or changing that exchanging that into aston martin getting a brand spanking new one soft like convertible put five thousand miles on it and then end up like because it was like for me it was like one of the worst cars i ever had it was like horrendous drive and to do like long journeys and it was not not the one um so then I end up selling it on like Auto Trader or whatever it was and uh, lost a fortune as you do with cars, you know, you could lose it, lose your money. So, but like I was an asshole doing that. Like seriously, like that, like when I was earning loads of money, bearing in mind like back then that was for me loads of money. So what, like I just look at myself and think I did it off of a TV show. You know, like thinking I was part of like entourage. Mm. You know, I was waiting for like four of my mates to get them and then we could like do car rallies up and down the M6 or whatever. Like, and it just, that wasn't the case. And I was, I was more interested in spending, like I say, duplicate things on duplicate things like shoes, what, um, watches I, I haven't got an issue with because watches, they, they, if you buy well, they, they go up in value. Well, when you when you say duplicate, straight away will come to my mind, my own personal thing, the watch we got on now, the Daytona, yeah. in 2011, 2012, when I was trying to build up this, and now looking back, because I didn't have the mindset of, this is a good investment, I just wanted to buy it because I wanted it to look fucking cool. That was, yeah. that was basically it. And uh, I had the stainless steel, I bought the rose gold and the gold. Yeah. And I had all three. Yeah. And I was like, because in my mind, I was like, yeah, you've got to get all three. If, if all three are available, I have to have it. Yeah. And now looking back, I'm like, you prick. Like, you're just, you're just, you're just doing it. Not because, again, I've got a smart head on and I'm gonna, this is going to be an investment. But it's almost like I'm doing it so the ego again. Mm. So I could turn around some, when I was younger and say, yeah, yeah, I've got all three of them. Mm. Like, and it's just like a bit of a wanky sort of thing. But you kind of have to go through it yeah. then to like look back at yourself and say god man yeah. if I can go back I would give that person some advice but also you know you've it's got not, you, it's not a bad it's not a bad thing to do though no like it's to not, take yeah. the, the watches I say like you, you could have easily gone and got a a, a silver gold and yeah. rose gold Lamborghini and, yeah. and they would have like been like tits up investments yeah. do you know what I mean so they're not the worst thing that you've ever bought you know, like for me, I I would buy. I've I've got I've got six, and I wanted the same. I was the same as you. I was like, well, I've got that. I want the rose gold, and I want the gold. Well, I've got the rose gold. I haven't got the gold. But what I have got is I've got a Sky Dweller. I've got this mm. one. I've got the rose gold. I've got an AP. I've got a Hublot, and I've got a Date Just as well. So I've got a, a nice variety of them. Obviously, yeah. you know for me they they're they're significant because i got them at significant points in my career yeah. and, and and i'm happy that i've got them and you know if you look at what i paid for them to what they're worth now they're they're great and and i love them like i say i love them i was thinking about getting rid of them all because you just like you come around london you just can't wear them anymore um but for me, like when you talk about like, or when I was saying about duplicating things and everything else, like that's where in football, especially you have to be very, very careful because in football, what I found was everyone's a follower. You're a follower of like creatures of habit. So all of a sudden, somebody has those pair of shoes, right, I need to get them those shoes. Somebody has that t-shirt oh i need that t-shirt you know we all we all do it like it's, it's the reason why like celebrities endorse brands and everything else because all of a sudden what happens is that you, everybody needs to go out and buy that that item of clothing or whatever yeah. 
and football dressing rooms are exactly the same you know so you go out and you see this and you think oh, oh he has that and you think oh, I, need, I need to get that as well but whether you can afford to do it or not is uh, you know up, up to your own sort of circumstances so you, we have to be very very careful especially footballers or ex-footballers or celebrities or whoever it is be very careful like how you go about just showcasing what you have because the people that are either beside you or alongside you in your in your field are all looking at you thinking oh i can do that or i want that all right you know like if somebody had that like in my in my industry if somebody had that watch i'd be like well that's a better one than mine so do i need to get rid of mine to get that one mm. but i can't afford that one so well how do, how do i get that one and and you just all automatically go through that process and it's a very very difficult place to sort of get your mind out of mm. yeah i definitely resonate with that um my next question is going to be linked to this are footballers high profile footballers targeted i'll tell you why i say that so i feel like being 36 now and just remembering like old articles in newspapers like the sun who are like you know, star and stuff mm. like that that it has changed but i still feel feel like they give any athlete especially footballers a fucking hard time yeah. they really do because you put one foot perceived wrong uh, or you have a view which is against the narrative a bit it's almost like you know you're the bad person and i would say when i was younger maybe still now and you might agree or disagree but the football a lot of footballers were portrayed as the great at football and they're great on the pitch and they make a lot of money but they're not so educated in certain yeah. aspects mm -hmm. and i remember there was a thing and they took david beckham's uh comment out of context i don't know which paper it was but it was something like someone asked him football how long you've been in football why are you in football you know mm. who got you into football and he said something along the lines of which was which kind of um, was a bit not not hypocritical. It was it didn't really make sense, but he said I've played football all my life, all my life since I was seven years old, <laughs> and and the the media kind of played on that and said oh he's like kind of trying to say he's stupid, yeah, you know, dumb footballer, yeah, yeah. Dumb, dumb footballer. And then when you when they start doing that across a lot of them, you know, like making a mockery of of something they might have said something they like in a they might have said something quick and it come out a little bit weird yeah and I, I i don't think david beckham's stupid i mean clearly not he's doing some some fantastic things and he's a successful man but then it it means that certain all people organizations look at them at footballers and then trying to target them and we spoke about this when you came before about so-called financial advisors so-called yeah. financial experts will come into your community or your football club and they will start to in a seems like it's an educated way but like confuse you with bullshit or facts yeah. and figures and get you to invest into certain things or kind of funnel money out of you yeah so so i mean one do you agree with that and two do you think that's still happening now and going back to the question do you think footballers especially high profile ones are targeted yeah absolutely um i don't think it's just high profile i think you know any footballer is a is a target especially today in social media circles um what you have to realize is that with being a footballer you are rightly or wrongly in the public eye you're you know and you you have to live your life accordingly you know i was always to, told with social media if you wouldn't say it down the lens of a camera don't say it on social media you know that's was always a golden rule for me so i try to still live by that rule um there's there is a perception in football that or outside of football sorry that all footballers are dumb if you talk if you talk about the the difference between football players and rugby players football players are well paid extremely well paid public school kids who have had no up pretty much no upbringing who have to deal with life as it is rugby players not paid anywhere near as much as football players probably privately educated um and have a 
better understanding of what life is like outside of their sport. So when it comes down to uh, institutions coming into football and talking to football players about finance, whether it be mortgages, whether it be investments, whether it be property, whether it be um, any anything in terms of those sort of sector, they're an easy, very, very easy target because they don't know it. So what you need to have is you need to have honest people and you need to have people who are very, very clever around you to know when you're being taken advantage of. So what you find now is a lot of a lot of players, Deli Ali's very, very clever in the way he does it. A lot of people probably don't know things about Deli Ali that he and don't get me wrong, I don't I don't know him either, but I know a little bit about his story. So he he um he basically got taken in by a separate family when he was young. And now that family, um, the son of that family is now his basically manager. And he looks after all their, pro- like they have a property uh, company that he looks after all his properties and his finances and everything else. And he's always there when he does his deals because he looks after him. Mm. So any major decision, this this guy, and th- and they sit down and they talk together and, and they and there's no there's no rubbish, there's no bullshit. It's what do you think kind of thing. And they and they come up with a decision which is best for him, not what's best for the company, not what's best in the ten years time or twenty years time. It's what's best for him now. So when I talk, when I have these conversations with people in and outside of football, what I think needs to, is very very difficult because from a football club's point of view, if they had a financial advisor, if they had a mortgage broker, if they had uh, an investment counsellor who would determine whether you're a high, medium or low risk person, if you had a a car guy, if you, you know, and then all of a sudden something something goes wrong in those, out of those companies, you lose money, your car gets broken into and stolen or you, you know, we go into a recession and you, and you can't pay your mortgage or whatever it is, all of a sudden you as a player are then looking... At your, at your club basically saying, well, you guys put me into them. You now kind of have to get me out of it sort of thing. So there's a very, very, got to be very careful from a from a club's point of view, as well as if you talk about the PFA and the FA and, and all the other institutions in football, because the same would be the, the case with them. So if you look like, if you were the PFA and you come into me and said like, we know this guy and he's, he's done really well for X, Y, and Z footballer. Um, go with him and then all of a sudden he puts you into a scheme of, of for whatever whether it be investments mortgages whatever and that loses you money all of a sudden then you look at him but then you look at the, the club who put you into it or the PFA who, who put you into it you'd be like well you said he was really good and now he's just lost me money so where's my money kind of thing so it's a very very difficult thing so what I think needs to happen is it needs to be a little black book of very very well trusted people so again uh property people finding you your best returns for the areas that you want to invest in newcastle manchester liverpool down south london surrey wherever it would be you decide that then you go to the mortgages we have the best mortgage brokers in in the country we we might not be the best on rates, but we will find you what's best for you. Investments. Are you a, are you a high, medium, or low risk investor? You know, if you're a high risk investor, Bitcoin is the one for you. If you're a medium investor, I don't know, whatever the next one is. In, if you're a low investor, gold might be for you. You know, whatever it is. Same thing for cars, same thing for jewelry, same thing for what? So you have a five a sort of five man shortlist. And then in your investment portfolio, you invest into a pension scheme because that's what you need to, you need to make sure that you, you're right after football. Bearing in mind now footballers can't access their money in a pension from the day they retire till 55. So if you're very lucky and you get, and you get to 25, 20 years, you can't access your money. So that, that in itself is a, 
a long period of time that you have to try and find some money for. So pension for one, I would say property would be another one because as long as you can afford to and you get rents in buy to lets, if you get enough rent in to cover your mortgages, you shouldn't really go too wrong with with mortgages uh, with with property. And then it comes down to the other the other couple, which is investments in terms of stocks and shares or whether it be something else and then um your mortgages in, into uh art. Woodbury Hub art. <laughs> so you said it don't me <laughs> you just like so then I, I think that there needs to be um like i say a little black book of of companies who yeah. are well trusted and listen it wouldn't be a case of whether it appear if, if it was the PFA or the FA or whoever said like these are our five companies yeah. it wouldn't be them turning around and going you have to invest with them please go and invest with them they are the best it would be like you've just signed a new deal worth 150 grand a week the likelihood is that you're probably going to get a knock on your door or the phone's going to ring and it's going to be this this is and this person and they're going to try and sell you this this is and this investment if you want to go with them fine no problem but talk to these guys because these guys are the best and these guys we trust. You don't want to go with them, fine. Go out on your own and do what you do do your own thing. At least then they get that little bit of a, a gap between we we want you to invest with them and we want you to be with them and we want you to be financially secure at the end of it to don't do, do it and go with somebody else and, and, and be a, you know, a good luck on a whim sort of thing. So... There is a big, big thing, and and the the stats are, are seriously, seriously damaging to football and football players. There's like something like seventy eight percent of footballers after the first five years go bankrupt, and I think it's even worse for divorce levels. So that sort of says to you that within football, people aren't looking after their money, and then after football, they continue to live the life of being a professional footballer earning X amount of millions a year or whatever and they can't sustain it so there needs to be people looking after them but looking after them for their sake not not the the companies making fortunes off of them hmm. what i found interesting when we spoke before obviously not on the podcast when we were just having the chat um the realization that i had when you were saying about in actual fact even some of the premiership footballers or a majority of them there there are there's there's the obvious ones that can sustain probably their life because they've made so much money yeah. and they they branded themselves right and they're still getting a lot of work today john terry yeah lampard i would say yeah. i don't know this for sure i'm just taking a guess yeah. calculate a guess did they drop by you'd notice in this all the chelsea players gonna know if I, <laughs> uh, let's go outside of that uh, um rio ferdinand yeah uh, there's going to be like Zidane's. There's going to yeah. be Dave, so your high, David Beckham's. Your, your very, very high profile yeah. players, yeah. yeah, will be. They would have been well looked after, and and they would have been, they'd have been earning such a significant amount of money in their time, as well as. So like somebody like Frank Lampard, I don't know, hundred and fifty grand a week, hundred grand a week, or whatever, going back. 10, 10 years or so, right? 2012, let's say, probably earning nearly 100 grand a week, I'd say. Then you've got the bonuses on top. Yeah, you've got everything. Like, say, you know, England, you've got Champions commercial, League. commercial deals, you've got endorsement deals, you've got, you know, appearance bonuses, Champions League goals, everything. All of it all comes into it. So let's say, for instance, I don't know... <clears throat> 30 million quid a year, right? Frank Lampard would earn, right? Astronomical amount of money. And he would have been able to go bang, 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 bang. And he won't need to work again, right? And if he sat on his ass, he wouldn't need to work again because he he put so much and, and he was very clever and he had the people around him that were very clever to put him into things that he wouldn't need to, to work again in football. But that's not the case for majority of players I think you'd be very like I was having this conversation earlier in the gym I think you'd be very very surprised on how many footballers would be able to sit there and do absolutely nothing for the rest of their life after they finish playing because it takes you have to be I think I, I did it and I can't I think it was about 30 grand a week for about six years 
So it's like 1.5 million over a course of six years without investing anything, just, just putting it all in the bank, all in the bank or into your pension pot or whatever. For you to be able to sit there and and be fine. Now you, t- there. He he was saying to me that there was a guy who just signed for a newly promoted club from a championship club who's now on sixteen grand a week because he like for me he w- he would have been on not like he'd been on like sixes or sevens at the club that he was at, and he was like, nah, but surely like why would he sign for a Premier League club on like that? And I was like. But you've got to be very, very careful because there wouldn't be that many. You take out City, Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, Man United, um, Tottenham, Newcastle now, Everton, some of them, West Ham. There would there won't be that many across the whole playing squad that will be over thirty grand a week. Because it's just unsustainable for, mm. for football clubs. Mm. You look at like Brentford, for example, <clears throat> West London Club done unbelievable last year they've probably got last year two two maybe Christian Eriksen being one if it was over 30 grand a week because it's just not sustainable for them you know so Watford maybe had a couple Burnley maybe had a couple Leeds might have had one or two like there, there wouldn't be that many, but everybody seems to like when when you talk about footballers, you have got to be very careful. They're people first, right? So that's first and foremost. So they get to live however they like, flashy cars, whatever they want to do. But you have to be very careful when you think that you talk about all footballers in the same bracket as your John Terry's, Rio Ferdinand's, Frank Lampard's, David Beckham's, because not everybody earns that sort of money, and they're not all very, they're not all as financially secure as as people think that they are. Mm. So it's very, it's a very sort of like difficult space to play in because we all put footballers on a very high pedestal. Mm. Yeah. Cause like if you, if you um, think of football, I think probably the couple of names that come to your mind straight away is Neymar. Yeah. Messi. Ronaldo. Yeah. And Ronaldo. Yeah. And Ronaldo, when I looked it up on uh, Google recently, I think this year, because when I got into podcasting, a guy called Rob Moore, who runs a really good podcast called Disruptors, um, he's done really, really well. And he was talking about the benefits of having a social profile. And mm. then you could do like, you, you probably do it yourself with like brand endorsements and deals and promotions, etc. And he said, on the top end of the stuff, and he said, this is the top end, but this is what Ronaldo does. At the time he was, he was posting, he was doing like 300, 400,000 pound a post. Yeah. Now... It's like 1.2 million pounds or 1.5 million pounds. Yeah. And it's like, he's so successful as a profile that he would have to do something fucking stupid in order to go broke. Yeah. And we put that in its box and say, right, well, every footballer must be like that. Yeah. But then I speak, spoken to ones and I'm not going to drop any names, but they come in there and they've been in rehab and they've been on the bread line and they, they, they have to do, certain jobs that yeah they do it because it's, it's they're not really passionate about it like they're just doing it because they need they need to bring in some money and i'm like and you do you, you naturally and I, i'm and i've got to criticize myself for thinking like this but you naturally go i used to watch you on tv yeah yeah i saw you against man united or chelsea and you scored that banging goal and everyone loved you and like oh fuck it's yeah. like it's like it's, it's 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 a bit of a like oh my god like how how life can change so quickly yeah so take football away from it quickly and everybody of a certain age will be familiar with a band like Westlife right the main singer in Westlife Shane went bankrupt but bearing in mind they were probably the biggest boy band in the nineties early two thousands number ones all the time. X amount of selling records, X amount of selling albums, like sold out concerts all the way around. He put in, put a lot of money into property. Like it, it set up a company which went bankrupt, which, which wiped away all his money. But if you said that like in the nineties when they were flying high, that in five years time, six years, 10 years time, you'd be bankrupt. If you're looking at him going fucking crazy, you know? hmm. 
So you, we have to, like as a society, we have to be very careful. Like, don't get me wrong, it's very, very easy to do it. Like you go into, you see your Messi's, your Neymar's, your, you know, your Ronaldo's, your Mbappe's, you're like the, the top, top players of the, of the country in the world. And you think, I, I, I want to emulate them. It's the reason why a lot of footballers get into football is because they see their heroes doing an unbelievable piece of skill and they go down the park and they try and emulate that piece of skill. Right? It's the reason why a lot of kids get into it. One, to do the piece of skill. Two, to play in front of thousands of people. And three, because the money's very good. Right? They're the reasons. Then all of a sudden, you then put into the other bracket of what fame does to people and it takes people down a really really dark path and then it's what you do after football and after the fame finishes and then that's an even darker path mm. so we have to as a society we have to be very very careful of how we perceive celebrities famous people sports people you know musicians all those sort of things because ultimately I said it before they're people and we still have the same amount of eyes, same yeah. nose, same ears. You know I mean, we all are the same people. Mm. So just walking down the street, you crossing the road, you cross the same road and at exactly the same time as I do, as same as Mick Jagger does. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like it, it's exactly the same. We we do we do the same things all the time. So just because they're paid millions of pounds or they sell millions of records or they, they're a movie star like Brad Pitt and George Clooney. Just, they're just people, yeah. you know, like, and, that, and I think that's a big thing for, for a lot of people. The amount of, you think of how many celebrities or artists or singers, footballers, whatever it is, don't, don't like to be public. They like to have their privacy is because it's the only way they can be normal. Yeah. So it's a very, very difficult, difficult space to be in. So as a society, we need to sort of understand that and recognise that a little bit more. Um, Andy Ruiz Jr., yeah. professional boxer, yeah. beat in an unpredictable way Anthony Joshua yeah. and become the first heavyweight Mexican ever in history yeah. in New York. Um he had all his fame, all this money, and then he got into the rematch and just got outboxed. And then Anthony Joshua become two time world champion. Mm -hmm. And I watched his post fight interview and uh, Andy Rees Jr. And he even admitted that because he was the first one ever, and because this literally changed his life financially, and he had everybody throwing stuff at him. And there was, he went from, you know, a, just a professional fighter getting by to literally going in Rolls Royces and mm. buying everything you wanted to buy. Yeah. He admitted and he got he got into the second fight fatter than yeah. he was in the first fight. And then the guy's never gonna have abs. That's just <laughs> you know, but he he came in like, you know, like a doe ball, yeah. literally. And he said it's because he was very, very much distracted. So my 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 question to you, uh, which is an I was inadvertently saying to you, and this is not me, because you know my position about people earning a good amount of money, especially young footballers, mm -hmm. it inspires me. Stepping in my father-in-law's shoes, he would say something along the lines of, do you think footballers get paid too much money? No. No, I don't, I don't because ultimately you're only worth as much as somebody's going to pay for you. And the reason why I gave you this example, and because we were talking about this very thing last night, and I did see where it's coming from, and uh, Andy Rears Jr. fought his heart out because he was like just getting by and basically in Mexico yeah. is a hard life. And yeah. there's that, you know, like when that kid comes out of the council estate, whether they're football or fire, yeah. and they, they make it because it, they're literally fighting to get out of that environment. But when they're in this new environment, that slight hunger may go because now, who mm. said it? Ro uh, Sugar Ray Robinson or someone like that said, it's hard to get up for a run at five o'clock in the morning it's in silk pajamas. <laughs> because he was saying that once you've got all this money, yeah. it's very, very difficult to sacrifice yeah. you know, certain things and go out there and, 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 and then fight for your position. I do get that. If someone was on 300 grand a week, opposed to, right, 
if you play really well in the next few matches, you're going to get signed full time by Chelsea, and you are then going to be on 300, 400 yeah. grand a week, and you're going to be playing in Champions League, and you're going to get this endorsement deal, but you ain't going to get it unless you play really well. That person is going to play their heart out. Yeah. But once you're there, are you going to continue is, to play your heart is, out? Is yeah. it at that point? Is it? Are they getting paid too much? Well, that's that's the that is the that then comes down to the individual because when you when you then get your 300 grand a week or or whatever your money is then it comes down to are you still the same person are your goals still exactly the same i do you want to play at the highest level do you want to play for your country do you want to play in the champions league do you want to if you're a striker do you want to continue scoring goals if you're you know whatever your goals are do they change just because you've now got money or do you do your goals stay the same and the money is just a an added bonus to you so that's a that's just a genuine question to to every footballer and the likeliest are the the ones at the top level so majority of lads in the premier league probably the money doesn't really mean a great deal to them i think it's more as long as their family are secure as long as they've got like life after football sorted pretty much then whatever the rest that they earn is kind of like immaterial to them. Yeah, understood. Well, let's talk quickly about sacrifices. There's one question around that. Do want to talk about your football because <laughs> we've not really talked much about that. And then uh, we, can, we can round off the conversation. Here, here's what I mean. Uh, March 2021, the son said, uh, you only met your newborn daughter over Zoom, Ella Ray. Yeah. Um, because you was obviously playing in Australia. I yeah. mean, I was there with both my sons were born. Um, the second second time, I was, it was mental. He was literally born down the toilet, but I'll tell you about that <laughs> probably off air. And it was just all mental. But if I was in another part of the world, and no matter whether I was very successful or doing all right, I would be like, man, I'm like, it'd be hard. Yeah. It'd be a bit of a pill to swallow. What was that like? It was difficult, very, very hard. Um, and how long was it until afterwards you got to meet her in person? Three months. So oh, she wow. was born in she was born end of February, twenty sixth of February, and I came home uh, about sixteenth of March, sixteenth uh, of May. Sorry. Um, yeah, listen, it was ridiculously hard, um, but. This is where like, I have to give like a lot of credit to my wife because when, so the, the pandemic was awful for a lot of people and it was awful for us because when I had agreed to go out to Australia um, in January, we had a plan. So our plan was I would leave middle of January. I'd, I'd have two weeks on my own to settle in, settle in the apartment. Then she would come out for two weeks, first two weeks of uh, February. Then she would leave, go home. My, I'd have another two weeks on my own. My parents would then come out for like three weeks. Then they would go home and then they would all come back out together for the end of the season, which is sort of end of April, which is my birthday. And then we would do a little bit of a tour through Australia, then sort of uh, Southeast Asia. And then sort of, Europe and come, and come back round um, to home. So we would do a little bit of a tour. One, because, you know, we'd never seen that part of the world before and it would actually be a quite nice little little tour on the way back, a couple of days here, Singapore, Shanghai, that sort of thing. And then and then back round to, to Europe and stuff like that. Um, then obviously you get, to, <laughs> I go out for two weeks, settle in. She comes out for two weeks. It pissed down with rain. So you're in the, one of the hottest countries like who has sun 360 days out of 365 and she all of a sudden bought 14 days of, of pissing down with rain. So like in my apartment, I was on the 24th floor of 26 six, and we lost electricity. We lost water. Yeah. We, and when you do that, like your lifts don't work. So you've got to walk down. 
so you have no showers no toilets so you have to walk across the road to the supermarket or the shopping center and you have to brush your teeth and go to the toilet and stuff so you have to pick and choose your times of going out the how uh, the apartment bearing in mind if you go 24 floors down you got to go 24 floors <laughs> back up so you spend a lot more time but because it's pissing down rain you can't go anywhere so you're sort of stuck in the confines of either a dark apartment watching netflix on your phone or you go to this like the supermarket um center where there's a couple of shops and that's about it and you just sit and chat absolute shite to each other for a bit um so she decided to do that um then she left just after to valentine's day she left on the 15th and uh she came home had a couple of weeks on my own my parents then came out for for three weeks so they came out at the start of when the pandemic pretty much started so started in in march and my dad owns or owns his own business um and bearing in mind the time difference and things like that he was getting calls throughout the night saying like you know this person's cancelled this job's cancelled so on and so on so he was getting like ridiculously stressed bearing in mind australia is probably the most relaxed country in the world he was probably the most stressed person in the whole of australia at the time so I could see that happening. So they end up staying for about two and a half weeks here. They had to fly home. I then stayed out. I flew home and on Jan, uh, on April the 1st. Um, came, was home from April the 1st until July. And then in that time, my wife, she fell pregnant. Um, so then we had to then plan, but we had to plan through a pandemic where traveling wasn't a thing. Australia was very tight on it as well. Well, they, they were quite smug in their way because they had the sunshine and everything else in they and they were just going about their lives as, as normal and they didn't have the, the rollout of the vaccine till later on down the line. Um, they just shut the borders. No internal travel, no one from outside the, the countries could come in unless you had certain visas and things like that. Um, so I then, obviously she told me on her birthday in June that she was pregnant. So I was like, Jesus, I'm now going to go back to the other side of the world, knowing that she's carrying our child. So I go from July to September, finish off the season that we had to pause, came back in um, September through to uh, beginning of November November I was out there then until May and our daughter was born 26th of February so on the 26th of February or a couple of days leading up she was two weeks late um, didn't didn't fancy coming out um, so I was training and then obviously checking the phone all the time and then I finished training one day and got a FaceTime call from the mother-in-law and she was like, she was there and your whole world changes. So it was, it was just a really, really mad time because of the pandemic. And we didn't want to bring her over and have our daughter in Australia because my wife didn't want to fly or that close to the, the, because obviously the dangers of, of flying that close to the due date and things like that. Um, then, she didn't want to fly straight after because she would have had to do two weeks of quarantine. I wasn't allowed to go into quarantine because from outside in, you weren't allowed in. Um, then obviously the complications of being a new mother and a newborn baby in quarantine, you need all sorts of little bits. Plus you need medical attention here, there and everywhere in case something's wrong. Um, so we decided that the best, the best case for me, I, my club wouldn't they would have allowed me to leave i could have just said look i'm done thank you very much like i've really enjoyed my time i'm going but we had decided as a family that the best case was to stay and then come home once the season's pretty much done um and when i decided that i was leaving i decided sort of middle of april and then it 
it took a little bit of time to negotiate my release and then uh yeah then i decided to to come home middle of may and and i mean the flight was horrendous because i had to do a layover for about seven or eight hours in an airport that was shut nothing in nothing to do i was lying on the the floor and just trying to get a little bit of sleep and then um but then you go through Heathrow airport and I mean like I said I had like seven or eight bags golf clubs but you come around the corner and at like six in the morning they're all there and you've got this little little baby three month old like was just like unbelievable you know like i'd do 24 hours flying no problem to come home for that that mm. no problem but i wish i was there at the beginning because now when i came home and and i want i wanted to spend every minute of every day with her because i missed three months and that's where like now is so important to me of what I do next is that I don't want to spend too much time away from them. And now we've obviously got another little boy on the way. Like there's no way, nothing will, will stop me from being there. Mm. Not a chance. You know, it was very, very tough, but we made the decisions which we thought were the best for our family at the time. And we were really lucky that her mum's unbelievable. She was with her all the way through you know, had she been on her own, then I would a hundred percent flown back and said, forget, forget the football. Like it's, it, you know, it doesn't matter to us. Um, but because she had support around her and everything else, like I was happy with what she was, she was getting. Yeah. Must've been really emotional. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an emotional person. I'll be honest because it doesn't really, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm never like probably in the last 20 odd years or so I've probably cried twice you know and 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 they're over silly things as well they're not even over um things you would think of um so it in terms of emotion it was it it was an internal emotion that you think like life has changed not I'm like on the floor bawling with tears mm. like oh, oh my god <laughs> maybe the, with the boy yeah. that comes out it might be a bit different but it was uh yeah it just it was just a bad bad time like when the pandemic was horrendous for a lot of reasons for a lot of people it was it was for us but it gave me something that you can never take back so it was great yeah. so you're 1987 yeah that makes you 34 35 35 Okay, cool. I'm 36. I'm 37 this year. Um, why did you retire? Um, so I came back from Australia, got a new family, um, and the pandemic was hard on football clubs. People on furlough, people losing their jobs, um, have it, teams having smaller squads. And... I just finished my A license. So in in license terms, you go from B license, A license, pro license. So I'm as qualified as I need to be to be a, a coach as a as a manager at certain levels if you need to go if you want to go in and be Jurgen Klopp, you've got to be a pro license holder, which I've applied for. Um so when I came back from Australia, I was like well, the pandemic actually might help me here because I can still play. I want to get coaching experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to phone as many of the clubs or speak to as many of the clubs and the managers and the people that I know in the game as, as I possibly can do and say, I know that you're running at a reduced squad and I know you're running at a reduced staff. Bring me in. Bring me in. I can help you with both. You know, if you want me to play five games a season stick me on the bench I'll play you five games a season but what I'm more interested in is I'm more interested in getting coaching hours and and being around that and and understanding how it works and why you make those decisions and and how you go about setting up your week and your and your game prep and your pre and post match stuff but nobody and I mean no like I had two offers 
One was north of Manchester and one was north of Nottingham. Mm. And I just spent three months away from my little girl. Mm. I said, there's no way in hell I was leaving. Like, because, and all of those clubs were within the league. So they were league two. Um, and so in league two, you play 46 games, league games a season. Mm-hmm. Then you were throwing like the cup games and stuff. So all of a sudden you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, pretty much throughout the whole season, right? So I'd never be at home. So again, spent three months away from her to then all of a sudden go and spend time away from her in England, let alone the other side of the world. So I was just like, nah, not having that. And I tried to go in a couple of places as a coach. Again, haven't been successful in that. Um, so I just, I just said to myself, like, mom, I'm, I'm going to retire because I was 34 at the time. And I always said to myself, I was, I remember when I, when I said it to my wife, I was like, I'm, I'm going to retire. what do you think? And she was like, up to you. And I was like, okay. So I was on the flight over to Greece. We we're going on holiday. And I started to write in my notes like a a statement of like my retiring statement. And I always said to myself that if I started to write it and I got emotional over the fact that I was actually saying it, like writing it down, I wouldn't do it. But as I was writing it, I was feeling more proud of what I achieved than I was about feeling regret of what I was about to leave behind. Mm. So yeah give it a couple of uh give it a couple of weeks after that and and i just you know i I sort of made the statement and said like you know that's that's me i'm saying thanks very much for my playing days i'm gonna give coaching a crack um so yeah that was that was basically why do you know uh the difference between playing for your your uh country premiership championship league one Mm. Which I believe you played in all, all of those, yeah. 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 Um, by the obvious, like from Premiership to let's say uh, uh, League One, obviously the teams, maybe the money, etc. But what, what as a player on that field is is it is it much of a difference? Yeah, yeah, there, there is the standard. It, it's just a level of intensity, yeah. a lot of it, and the decision making, how how quickly players make make decisions um I, I i'm a firm believer if you took names away and took sh- like badges away if you put an 11 from chelsea and 11 from you know south end or whatever it would be in a park and you mix them all together you'd probably have a draw because you wouldn't be worried about who you were playing up. If you didn't know anybody, you know, if they're all just blank faces and you, and I, I'd, I'd probably say you'd end up with a draw or a very, very close game yeah. because you wouldn't be worried about who you're playing up against. Like when you, when, when you think about like lower league teams playing other like higher place teams in like the FA cup and things like that. The reason why you get upsets is because the big teams, when they go down to the smaller grounds, they can't, they, it's very difficult. Like the pitches are more compact. The stadiums are smaller. The change rooms are smaller. They're out of their comfort zone and they're not used to being in them, in those surroundings. They're used to the big shiny new stadiums with massive areas. And that's why when you see lower teams go to like Man City and they get like slapped up five, six and seven is because they can't deal with the pace of the, and the expansion of the of the pitches so i i do think that there's a big when you talk about um the differences the differences is that well kevin de bruyne is able to make so many decisions at such a quick speed than somebody playing in like league one league two yeah and he's so much more confident in his own ability in terms of how to control a football what type of pass he needs to make, who he's going to pass to, the options before he's received the ball. That's all of those sort of things. He's able to make those decisions quicker than somebody else in the lower leagues. So I'm going to ask you probably four more questions and then we're going to round, yep. round this off. Uh, 
Probably one that you've probably been asked a few times, but I feel like it's only right for me to ask you. What's probably been your highest moment in your career? Um, I probably have, I've probably got three. My debut is one because you don't get anywhere without it. Premier League debut, although it was cut very, very short. Reading? No. Uh, West Brom, live on Sky, away at Blackpool. Um, got a sending off in the first 15 minutes of the game and then I was the sacrificial lamb who got hooked straight after that. So uh, so that was, <laughs> that was unfortunate. And then international. So in the international one, there's, there's two, obviously international debut, but then playing in the European Championship Finals of 2012 was unbelievable. What's your lowest moment in your career? Um... Oh, uh, probably. I think it's probably easy to say lowest part would be not being at the birth of my daughter, being the other side mm. of the world. But if you were talking purely football, um, oh, I, I, to be honest, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question before. I don't. I don't know. Is the honest answer. Um, I was lucky enough I never got relegated. That was that was one thing I never got. So I was quite lucky in that sense. Um I was only sent off once, which I mean dubious in itself. Uh so yeah, I probably don't really have in terms of football terms, I don't really have a low point. Uh last question around the football and then we're gonna we'll round this off. Um most iconic player you played with or against or someone that you thought oh my god they've been sent, sent down from god this person <laughs> really is elite level um yeah again so difficult because fortunate i was lucky enough to play in some when you play in the premier league you play against your rios your john terry's and your Lampards and your Drogba's and people like that. Um, but then, then you go to like the international level and I was lucky enough to play against Italy, Germany, England, Spain, Portugal. So like that you, then you thought like you have to look at who was in those teams so weird when you say I get I played against England because like yeah. obviously when I speak to you I still see you as English yeah yeah. but, but obviously you're you know you're yeah. like playing for Ireland yeah so when you when you go through like the England team I think that day Carrick Rooney um, oh, I mean I'm even struggling myself now um talk about the england team yeah lampard but, gerard i don't know yeah i'm not gerard possibly i don't think lampard was in it for some reason um but then you go to like spain like the amount of times that i played against spain like two or three times and it was like xavi iniesta busquets torres. ramos torres casillas then you go to italy and you've got chiellini bonucci um, Pirlo you think like and this is so when you talk about like when you at the start of this and we said about me and I was a kid from Reading who was sold at the age of 19 to Swindon and then from Swindon at the age of sort of 20, 21, got his move to West Brom, got his then moved to Forest and things like that after. So League One with Swindon, Championship with West Brom, promoted first season to the Premier League, international debut, next season was the European Championships. So f within four seasons, I'd gone from League One 
to the European Championships. So then all of like my mindset was nowhere near where it needed to be. So I I couldn't I couldn't process playing in front of seven and a half thousand mm. at the county ground at Swindon to playing in front of seventy thousand at the European Championships and everything in between. Go along for the ride, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Like what a ride. But trying to process it, it was mm. so, so difficult. But I don't have a I don't have somebody who really, really was like unbelievable. I was just very, very, very fortunate to play against some incredible and I say incredible players. I can imagine, mate. Last question. Good. When I first started my uh sales company when I was younger, it was predominantly sales pe uh, it was all sales people, predominantly men. Yep. And to keep them switched on in in the groove. I come up with a mantra okay. and it goes like this, be happy, never content. Now, if I were to ask Simon Cox's version of be happy, never content, what does that mean to you? Be happy would mean to me to stay present, yep. to have the people around around me telling me what's right, what's, right, what's wrong. Um, and be content would be to- Never content. Well, be never never be content with settling with what you have yeah because there's always there's always another day there's always something else to strive for like i am with my 131 um challenge so there's always something else to to do so sitting around and doing nothing isn't something that should be done you should always continue to strive for more yeah i love that mate really appreciate your time top man i hope you like saunas because we've been sitting, <laughs> there, sitting in one for two I'm hours like, I, lost, I lost some kilos <laughs> in here um thank you very much appreciate and, it uh, if everyone's enjoyed the podcast please subscribe share it with your friends and family yeah. obviously simon's on i saw you on tiktok now as well yeah, yeah? i know i'm trying my absolute balls Tip, off for that tiktok <laughs> superstar in the making um obviously follow simon you probably know who he is anyway um and yeah be happy never content thank you very much cheers cheers bro